So we spend about half a million dollars a month as a company and main post as an ownership group, investing in the brand in a way um, that increases the value. A brand is very much like a person. And the more you like that person, the more authentic that person is, the more fun they are, the stronger the relationship between the brand and consumer. Branding is much bigger than it was. The brand resonates with some folks. Our exterior elements have a larger brand presence. Interior elements have a small one. You know, this is a, a big restaurant and you got a big position. How, how, much, are, uh, how much are you making? CMO? In this episode, I'm talking to Alice Crowder, CMO of Crispy Crunchy Chicken, a quick serve fried chicken chain with over 2,900 locations across the US. They're doing over $600 million in sales and are still growing. We're gonna talk about number one, branding, branding, branding. Alice has worked with big chains like Denny's, Crystal Restaurant, and Tropical Smoothie Cafe. They're all doing over $350 million in sales. So we're gonna talk about how Alice thinks about branding. Number two, we're gonna dive into the company's top three marketing focuses this year. Rebranding, influencer marketing, and data analytics. And number three, we're gonna try to figure out all the little things like how much I spend in marketing spend per month or per year, how much I spend on influencer campaigns, and lastly, how much Alice gets paid as the CMO. And every time she can't answer a question, we're gonna take a shot of spicy but delicious hot sauce from our sponsors, Mac Hot Sauce. Wish me luck, Martians. I hope you enjoy this one. Hello, hello, Martians. Welcome back to another episode of Marketing on Mars. Uh, I'm super excited for this episode because I'm a huge foodie. Um, especially when it comes to food that I can eat with spicy food. And so today we, uh, or spicy sauce. So today we have the CMO of a company called Crispy Crunchy Chicken, um, Alice Crowder. She's currently the CMO. Uh, Crispy Crunchy Chicken has uh, 2,900 stores across the US. Uh, and it's probably one of the best fried chicken you've never heard of. So um, very excited for today's episode. Alice, thank you so much for coming on the show. Oh, thank you for having me. Yeah, so so 2901 stores across the US. T tell us about tell us a little bit about Crispy Crunchy Chicken and kind of like the origin and maybe how you got started as well. Sure. So, uh Crispy Crunchy is going to turn 35 this year. Um it started in Southern Louisiana. Uh, with a convenience store owner who was looking to add a little bit better quality food service than, you know, roller hot dogs in his stores. Mm -hmm. He was also a, a amateur chef. So he took uh, his fried chicken, his family fried chicken recipe and started making it up fresh in his convenience stores. Um, from there, it really caught on. It became a regional favorite and uh, it spread to become its own business. Hmm. Uh, it was very much for a long time a business targeted towards operators, helping them grow revenue. And then a couple of years ago, we were purchased by Main Post Partners who said, this is a brand. Like, mm. how do we make this a brand? And so um, a new executive team was brought in. I was brought in last January, and we've been doing the work to build the same kind of relationship we have with our operators, with our end users and our guests. Mm, so historically very operator focused, but now focusing more on the relationship directly with the consumers. That's, that's awesome. Um, I'm going to yes. quickly walk through your background, but before we do that, you know, the theme of the show um, it is a spicy podcast. So we're going to start off the show with a shot of hot sauce today. I got one of our sponsors, Mac one, um, their, their, their hot sauce. I have actually three different types that have Mac one, Mac two and Mac three. And so I'm going to be, I'm going to start off with Mac one and, and start my way up, but, uh, we're going to start off the show with a shot of hot sauce. And as the show goes on, I'm going to ask you unfiltered questions to try to figure out all the secrets behind marketing. 
And every single time you can't answer a question, we plead the fifth, we take another shot of hot sauce, and we move on. So what do you got for us today? What's what's your hot sauce of choice? So I have uh, a line of hot sauces called Good Looking Hot Sauce. Uh, and they go up in heat as we go. We have the Sweet OG, which is pretty mild. Okay. Uh, we, we have Cayenne You Handle It, which is uh, a couple of peppers. And the one I'm a little bit terrified of, if I'm honest, uh, is Ginger and Juice with four peppers. Ooh. So. I'm kind of hoping we don't get this far. Yeah, but let's see. It smells delicious. Okay, so since you have three, so you have three different hot sauce or four? Yes, you got three. Three. Okay, so maybe we'll start with level one, and then if we get to level two, three, we'll just we'll keep going, and I'll do the same. I'll go Mac one, Mac two, and Mac three. So let's start with uh, the first one. I'll start with. Uh, you have some chicken to go with your hot sauce. I do. Oh. Uh, chef is making it up for me right now. <laughs> oh my God. Chef Ray, if you're around, I'll take my tenders. <laughs> oh, here it is. Go. Thank you. Wow. Okay. So are you so, are we doing the call at the headquarters right now or behind the restaurant? Yes. This is a this is our uh, our Atlanta office. Uh, our CEO and I sit here. We have uh, associates all over the country, but this is our main office. Awesome. And what do we have today? What what is this? Um they are wonderful white meat tenders. They come into the store fresh. They're not frozen. Hmm. And then we double bread them on location. You can see that they're really large and there's a lot of yummy crispiness to them. Hmm. Um, the way that we get all the crispy, here's a secret for you, uh, is that we bread them in a cold water bath. So when the chicken, the fresh chicken hits that cold water, it shrinks up just like we would, holds on to more breading, and then we do it a second time to get even more breading. And so the result are these awesome, crispy wow. tenders. Wow, I can hear that. Okay, well, let's, um, let's maybe I'll, I'll, do a sh I'll do a shot here. And if you, if you want to do a shot with me or you want to dip with your chicken, you can go ahead and do that. So. Yeah, I think I'll do a dip. Okay, cool. Okay, cheers. Cheers. Mmm, good stuff. Oh, not good stuff. Oh, this is spicy. <laughs> Holy smokes. Okay, I think I didn't have much food. Maybe that's why. Um, <laughs> Ooh. I'll have to get you some tenders. Yeah, yeah. Maybe we should have shipped it over from Atlanta. Um, all right. I'm just looking through your background. Your 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 background is pretty amazing. You've you, you kind of started your career. Um, you, you, one of your first restaurants that that you worked at was Denny's. There, you were yes. the you were the VP. Um, Denny's. For those listening, everyone probably knows Denny's. $450 million in revenue, large company. Um, and then you moved on to, to, um, to a different company. You moved over to the Crystal Company, where you, you became the VP of marketing. Crystal Company does about $300 million in revenue. Um, um, and then you left and you joined Tropical Smoothie Cafe. That's like a $500 million revenue company. Now you're at Crispy Crunchy Chicken. Where I couldn't find too much information on cr cr crispy crunchy chicken and the revenue figures, help us out a little bit here. How how large is how large is the company? And this might be our first hot sauce question. I'm I'm hoping you can answer it, but uh, but yeah, yeah, we're proud of it. So um, as you said, 2,900 locations. Our annual revenue is about 600 million. Okay, so this is one of the largest companies you've you've worked with so far in your career. It has been, in terms of number of units, the largest company that I've worked for. Wow, that's amazing! And, and, and tell us uh, about the background. Like, how did you, how did you get uh, the the nod saying, you know, it's it, it we want you here because you were before that you were with um, Crystal rest Restaurant for four years as VP and then another year and a half as a CMO before that. That's correct. So um, I got a call from a recruiter who told me the story of Crispy Crunchy. Uh, and like a lot of people, I was not familiar with the brand. Of course, now I am. Um, 
And uh, I've loved this idea that this brand had been thriving and growing for almost 35 years, but that not a lot of people knew about it. And then I met the management team. We're led by our CEOs, a guy named Jim Norberg, who came from a long history at McDonald's, as well as Papa John's. Um, and everybody on the executive team has this really storied background in, um, in food service. And so you start to look at the model, you start to look at the awareness. And boy, I was just captivated by a product this good mm. that this many people don't know about and the approach that Jim and his leadership team were taking to uh, bring the message to the masses. And mm. uh, I just couldn't say no. Wow. Okay, cool, cool. Um, so does that mean you you were the first C-suite, one of the first C-suite hires because there was a bit of a rebranding that, that happened? Yes. So there, uh, previously, before we were purchased, there were only two C-suite positions. Uh, now we have quite a few. So we have our CEO, Jim Norberg. We have our chief financial and strategy officer. We have our chief execution officer, chief people officer, and me, chief marketing. Okay. So it went from two to like five. Yeah. Right. Awesome. And I, I know you, you talked a little bit about um, rebranding. I do want to dive into marketing and a bunch of, <laughs> and a bunch of questions. I, I would love to talk about branding with you. But first, our team did a little bit of digging in your, in your in your on your LinkedIn, and there were a few things that we found very interesting um, that that that, uh, oh. that you talked about. You use the word impeccable a lot. Impeccable. Yes. Tell us about the origin of that, like and 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 uh, yeah, like how that that whole thing started. Yeah. So uh, Craig Heidi, who's our chief people officer, led the executive team in coming up with our core values, um, what was important to us as an executive team, how we wanted to show up for our operators, our supplier partners, our teammates. Um, and one of the things we wanted to hit home was the quality with which we approach everything, whether it's our food, our relationship with our operators, or the relationships we have with our supplier partners, or the way we treat our teammates. But we are uh, a pretty quirky bunch and we love uh, chicken puns. So impeccable, uh, peck peck, oh. seemed like a good way to describe it. Peck peck, yeah. Um, peck peck. You've also done, um, and, th and this was pre, this was pre uh, um, crispy crunchy chicken, but you've done a marketing campaign with two chains, which is a, a rapper as well. Yes. Uh, tell us yes. what's the story behind that. That that seems, I I don't know two two chains. That that's a that's a big name to be working with. Um, and such a nice guy. We called him kind of jokingly. We called him Mr. Chains. Um, <laughs> Mr. Chains. But uh, at Crystal, um, the ownership really wanted to escalate the sense of relevance for the brand with. Mm. Um, with younger generation. And so we started talking to folks for whom Crystal was a big part of their childhood. Uh, Two Chains grew up in Atlanta. Uh, Crystal is an Atlanta brand. Um, he has a lot of nostalgia around the brand, grew up with it when he was mm. playing basketball. It's where they used to go. Um, and the owner of the company uh, at the time reached out to him um, he also had Crystal in his childhood uh, and they struck up a friendship. Uh, and, and so there was this idea that blossomed of two chains coming in, helping activate some initiatives for the company and being a spokesperson. Mm, that's so awesome. So now when you, when you think about, um, because they're, we're getting pulled in a million different directions with ads from company A, B, C, D, all the way to, you know, a million different ads all the time. When you think about ads and when, when you think about working with a big name like Two Chains, and I'm sure you, you at Crispy Crunchy Chicken, you're, you're, you're looking at uh, working with a lot of different influ influences as well. How do, you, how do you come up with a campaign that hits home with, with a certain uh, demographic, like making sure that ad dollar and the influencer campaign works well? 
do, do you go with certain emotions that you want to evoke or um, yeah, I'll, I'll let you like, how do you think about working with influencers? Yeah, authenticity is the most important thing. I think you're right. We get pulled in so many different directions as consumers. And as a result, we're savvier than we used to be. And we can sniff out somebody who is not genuine hmm. in their thoughts. We tend to, even here at Crispy Crunchy, leave our influencers alone for a bit and let us let them tell us good, bad, ugly uh, what they're seeing. Hmm. Now, once we have that message, we put a little science to it because, um, you know, everything's monetized. So what shows up in the feed is just a small percentage of the folks that follow an influencer. So we test it. We feed um, messages that we think will resonate um, to a larger audience and see what kind of engagement we get. Those that get higher engagement get a little more money. Those that get lower engagement, we pull back on. And in that way, we kind of optimize the voices that people are connecting the most strongly with um, in any given campaign. Okay, awesome. Um, okay, we're going to dive into influencer marketing for sure, um, um, especially when it comes to crispy, crunchy chicken. Uh, one last thing, I, I just, <laughs> we, we just, we just, we saw that you tried to create the largest frozen beverage, <laughs> the world's largest frozen beverage. Uh, and uh, so I was just curious, what inspired that uh, Guinness World Record attempt? Uh, it, it just sound, it sounds so like so much fun. Um, yeah, talk to us about that story. Yeah, um, we didn't just try. We did it. We're in the Guinness Book. Ooh. Uh, so uh, one of the things I've been fortunate enough in my career to have are brands that are playful. Mm. Um, at Crystal at the time, we were introducing a slush program with our partners, Coca-Cola. Uh, and so it was big news to us. We wanted it to be big news to everybody. Um, and we thought how to celebrate big news by going as big as possible. So we worked with Guinness. Um, we did it at, uh, we pulled it off at a, um, a state fair in Georgia. Um, it took a lot of coordination. It took a lot of science, uh, but people loved it and responded well to it. Um, my son still sleeps in the T-shirt that says "Pig Races, Roller Coasters, and the World's Biggest Slushy." Wow! Um, it was it was a great activity, and we got a lot of great press. That's that's crazy. I think that 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 is so key. It's just being playful and and having fun with building a brand, um, and that's not just in the B two C side. I, I see it now leaking over to in the B two B world where people are just trying to be more relatable and just be more fun and um, and just not be afraid to be a little spicy. Um, do you think that's one yeah. of the core parts of building brand? I know we're going to talk about brand a lot, but do, do you find that that is very key to building a, a good brand? I do. I, a brand is very much like a person that you meet and have a relationship with. Uh, and the more you like that person, the more authentic that person is, the more fun they are, the more you want to engage with them, the stronger the relationship between the brand and consumer. So if you're a stuffy, this is who I am, nobody wants to hang out with you. So nobody wants to buy your product. But if you're a little bit crazy, a little bit fun, you don't take yourself too seriously, it makes it easier to invite people mm. into your experience mm. as a brand. But you can't be too crazy. We all know that one crazy person, that one crazy friend that just goes a little over the top and you don't want to be that person, but then you don't, you don't want to be yeah. that stiff robotic person as well. You kind of want to be play that that fine balance between seriousness and, and and playfulness right it's a fine line and it depends on your category too like i don't want my tax advisor to be that wild and crazy guy but i'm okay if you know denny's comes out with like a super bacon product um because that's within what i expect from them yeah okay it's time for me to fire my accountant i think he's a little too much fun <laughs> gonna, i gotta have to double check that all right, so well, let's let's dive into let's dive into the company a little bit. Um, we've kind of talked a little bit about um, the company already about six hundred million dollars in revenue, big company, probably the biggest the biggest company that you've worked at. Um, has the company what's the history on fundraising? Um, was there ever was there a fundraise and what what was the last valuation? Um, and I and I and I know this is a very tough question. I've 
I have sensed something coming, but I got to ask anyways. Yeah, uh, that is one I'm going to have to take a, a, a shot on. We, uh, we are owned by private equity and we don't, we don't share that out. But let's just say that we're a beautiful jewel in the crown. Uh, I should have known that much. All right, we're going Mac 2. I'm doing Mac 2. I'm super nervous about this because the first one was already... I'm going to pour a little less <laughs> for this one. I'm going to get my tender back out. Yeah, the tenders. Oh, I'll pour a little bit more. Oh, yum. Cheers. Mm. Woo! Okay. Not as bad as the first one. This one's a little more sweet. Well, that's good. This is a little more sweet. Are you a fan of sweet, sweet uh, hot sauce or or you like it to just punch? I'm punch more it? salty. Oh, salty. I appreciate sweet, but I love salt. Yeah, I like I like salt better as well. Uh, yeah, that's a little sweet. Um, I like the first one better, but yeah, second one. Uh, maybe next time if I'm ever out in Atlanta, I'll just pack a suitcase of nothing but hot sauce and we'll we'll we'll, t we'll taste test all the different hot sauce together. You're welcome. Every time, anytime we got a test kitchen that'll be ready in another month or so, we'll cook up anything you might possibly want to eat. Oh man, that would be, that will be awesome. Um, so do you work from the office? Like th this office? Partially. Yeah. So this is my, this is the office I office out of. Um, we do a little bit of work from home like everybody does now mm -hmm. and a little bit of in office. Mm -hmm. Home is great for um, analytic stuff when you really need to put your nose down and do some heavy writing. But I love the office environment because that's where you get the collaboration. You get the one plus one equals three. You get to have much deeper and much more real conversations. Yeah. So there's a benefit to both. Yeah. Um, I, I'm, I'm super uh, excited. I'm, I have a few team members from Latin America that I have never met before. And uh, oh, gosh. Um, so, some of them are actually producers of this podcast. And uh um, and you actually see a few of them in this room right now. So yeah, I'm excited to, to, to meet, uh, the Latin American team. I'm uh, yeah, it's definitely meeting in person sure. is, is a big thing. Um, all right, let's dive into marketing. This is a marketing podcast. Um, I want to know all the secrets. I want to know what you guys are working on, what is working, what is not working. There might, there may be other listeners in the restaurant industry that could learn a lot from from your experience so let's dive into it right away so crispy crunchy chicken you guys are investing you guys brought in a new executive team really focused on branding so marketing is going to be a huge part of it where are you spending your your money right now um when, when you look at your marketing budget where, what are the buckets that you're spending money so right now, it's it, it, think of us as a 35-year-old startup almost. Um, so a lot of what we're doing is foundation building. So when I got here, um, there really was nothing. There was a small graphics team that kind of resized the same window cling over and over for each store that opened. We open a few hundred stores a year, so it's, wow. uh, it's a lot of work, but maybe not as impactful. So the first thing I did was do a, a traditional segmentation and awareness and usage study to tell us about how we were seen uh, by the consumers who knew us, to find out about our awareness, uh, to find out what people liked and valued about us and how they wanted us to show up. Uh, and that's really informed that book of work, everything that we've been doing. Hmm. From there, we reskinned the website. Uh, we looked at our stores, which were pretty dated, um, a lot of red and white, a lot of non-professional photography. Uh, and we set out last year to completely revamp the yeah. guest journey once they got on, on lot, starting with feather flags with huge drumsticks on them hmm. that signaled, hey, this is where you get good chicken. Um, letting people know about the brand, changing the colors up, and then pulling them from the street to the lot to inside the store to experience the food. Um, that was one of our first big initiatives. Uh, we also worked on the menu. So the menu had kind of organically grown like a Frankenstein monster. Yeah. There was a bunch of weird stuff on it. There was a bunch of stuff that had high waste. Um, and so we did... Uh, 
a study called a TURF, a Total and Duplicated Region Frequency Study. You may be familiar. Mm. It it tells you what the individual value of every item on your menu is. So, for example, a lot of restaurant folks that you talk to will say, okay, I got two items and they sell five units a day. They're dogs. I'm going to cut them. What TURF does is allows you to say, I do have these two items. With this one, if I get rid of it, everybody goes to tenders anyway. No big deal. With this one, if I lose these, this item that only sells five a day, I lose five customers. So it really mm. shows you hmm. what the reach and frequency impact of every item on your menu is. So wow. we simplified the menu according to that took off like six items. And you might say, as a lot of licensees did, um, oh my gosh, I bet you suffered. In fact, traffic went up, margin went up, waste went down. Holy. It was easier for consumers to navigate the menu. We also paired that with a menu architecture study to make it easier for people to find what they wanted. Um, and that was huge. So in our first year, fixed the menu. And now that we have space on it, we can add items that truly make a difference, uh, mm. that truly raise that reach, expand that reach, increase that frequency, because we know from quantitative research, that's what it's going to do. And then the look and feel of the whole brand. So those were our big two chunks of um, uh, activity for last year. This year, uh, we introduced a new chicken sandwich mm. uh, with a, a lot of fanfare, um, which is doing great. It's selling about double what it was from its previous life. Um, we're doing a lot of product innovation, and we're bringing third-party delivery to all of our stores to help them get that incremental boost of sales. Wow. Okay, so a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff that you're working on right now. Um, I'm interested in a few areas. Uh, and I think our listeners are probably too. Awareness testing. That was very cool. Brand revamping. Definitely want to dive into that. Um, so let's start with uh, awareness testing. How, how, did, how did you do it? How, how did you do that, that awareness testing? How did you figure out where you're getting uh, all your awareness? Is it just looking into the social media analytics? Or are you doing something deeper than that? Yeah, we did a formal study. Um, this is really important to understand. So we did something called an awareness and usage study. And basically, I'm simplifying it because there's a lot of calculation and model building involved. But we went out to a large group of people and did interviews um, like, hey, uh, Simon, can you tell me um, all the places that you get fried chicken today. And you would list some, right? Mm. Um, maybe crispy crunchies in there and maybe it's not. On a big enough scale, you find out in that way what your unaided awareness is. Uh, um, yes. Spoiler alert, ours is 4%. The, it's, it's, it's the, what do they call it? The, the, the barbecue test. When you, you go to a barbecue and you see how many people knows your brand when you talk about it. Yes. Right? Yeah, it's exactly what you do. Yeah. And then the follow-up question is, I'm gonna read you some names of uh, fried chicken places, tell me which of these you know. And then in that way, you're finding out your aided awareness. We, we're higher there. Then we take that group of folks who've heard of us and really dig deeply on the questions. How often do you go? What is most important to you when you're thinking about chicken? And if you choose crispy crunchy, what are the most important reasons that you end up going that way? We talk about eating in convenience stores. We talk about occasions. We talk about day parts. Mm. And in that way, we get a really good feel for how people are using us today, what kind of value we are showing them, um, and how we need to grow. I'll tell you, every brand I've ever worked for, um, one of the top two reasons that people chose the brand was it's close to me. Yeah. Um, at Crispy Crunchy, that doesn't show up to the very bottom. The first reason mm. is a perception of very high quality. Number two reason, very strong value. Number three reason, highly craveable. 
convenient to me doesn't show up into the very bottom and people who know will drive past other convenience stores to get to one wow. that has a crispy crunchy uh, in it, which is huge because we always, the kind of lore of the company was people come in to pay for their gas. They smell the chicken, they get the chicken. It's a hundred percent impulse. And that turns out not to be true. Oh my God. You know, they are looking for their favorite fried chicken and the more we can help them find it, the better for us. That's why when you go by our stores now, branding is much bigger than it was. It used to be very small in the quarter because we wanted to focus on, look at this beautiful chicken. Mm. But now understanding that the brand resonates with some folks, our exterior elements have a larger brand presence. Interior elements have a smaller. Make it easier for the people that want to have your chicken to find you. Right. hundred percent. So you guys have, yep. you guys have, are focusing on making more locations and also making them stand out when f the existing locations. Interesting. Yes. That is very, very yes. interesting. Okay. So, so did you do this formal study on your own? Did you hire a third party company? Did you use a SaaS product for that or how did you do um, We use a, a third party research company that I've used for several brands. Uh, where I've been, they also, they do great awareness and usage studies. They do great segmentation, um, but we also use them a lot in our menu innovation validation. Which, which company is that? Um, it's called Marketing Workshop. Marketing Workshop. Okay. Noted. Mm -hmm. Cool. So you, so you did the brand, the branding stuff with, oh no, you did the menu fix up. You did the awareness test with them. And then, you, and then with the branding portion, because this is key, this is your bread and butter. No pun intended, but yes. this is, this is your area of expertise. So yeah, this is my, um, my chicken and biscuits, we would say. Your chicken and biscuits. Um, let's dive into that, uh, a, a little bit. Um, did you do it all in house? Did you also hire a third party for the brand revamp? We used three or four different branding companies. Because we were starting from such a scratch level, I wanted to get several different POVs from design companies. Mm. It's hard with design companies. Yeah. And so I invested a little bit. Um, a all of them came back and said, why are your base colors red and white? That is the, those are the two most common colors in every convenience store. You're just melting into the background. Yeah. Um, yeah. So a couple of people, one of the brand, one of the folks we worked with was like, it should be lime green. And one was like, you know, it should be bright yellow. Uh, but we settled on this really beautiful, rich looking blue, which the red and white logo, which we still have, pops from. But it gives it, um, I call it a visual oasis on which to rest mm. so that when you see it, it's not cluttered up with a bunch of other stuff. You see a beautiful blue background and then our logo. Awesome. Okay, cool. Um, so, okay, so you're working with a bunch of different companies on the branding side, you're working with a company on the awareness side, and the menu fix up, there's a lot that goes into it. How much are you guys spending in marketing on a monthly basis right now? Or like annual? Less than you would think, right? So we're not a traditional franchise business that gets um, a part of all the gross sales. Um, a lot of what this brand is doing and mad props to uh, main post and mad props to our leadership team, specifically Jim, they all have said, let's invest and figure out what the right thing to do is. Let's show the value and then we'll go from there. Mm. So we spend about half a million dollars a month um, on studies, wow. on tests, I did a little media test uh, earlier this year, did an influencer test earlier this year. Um, so we're really, as a company and main post as an ownership group, investing in the brand in a way um, that increases the value to our operators and uh, certainly by extension of the brand. Mm, okay. Um, half a million. So that's like times two. That's like six million. Um, six million a year. So that's that's very little compared. To, that's like one percent of of your revenue. Uh, of yeah, the, it's tiny. The total revenue, yeah, of the company. That's that's pretty tiny. Um, 
That's amazing. And how much of that is, is spent in-house versus, uh, versus um, third party? Most is third party. So we still have an interior. Um, it used to be the graphics team. Now it's a creative services team. What they do has expanded quite a bit mm -hmm. uh, to uh, local store marketing things, um, chain work, um, presentations and sales materials. But we do have a creative agency. We do have an analytics agency that's helping mm -hmm. us with a pretty sophisticated um, pricing model that we have brought, that we've invested in to bring to our operators, as well as a social media agency that we're just now onboarding. Wow. Okay. Um, let's dive a little bit deeper into that. We talked about influencers a little bit. We mentioned uh, you worked with two chains in the past as well. So influencers, um, uh, working with influencers, is not you're not a stranger to, to this area. And you said that this is something that you test, Crispy Crunchy Chicken is testing this year. Talk to us about that. Like, what, what what kind of things are you testing right now with influencers? And what are you seeing that's working versus not working? When we launched the Cajun Chicken Sandwich, we invested in 46 influencers. Um, all the way from um, celebrity Amber Wallen down to a small group of folks that we gave a swag box and uh, a ticket for free meal to. Um, so wide range of payment. Um, then we went through the process that we talked about of increasing the number of people who viewed those, uh, that content and, and really investing in the ones where there was high engagement. Mm. So, um, Amber Wallen's post, you know, a lot of people know her, a lot of people love her, really high engagement, a couple of smaller players just to have incredible charisma, uh, also had very high engagement. And for those folks, we're talking about a more permanent relationship. Mm. So love what you did with Chicken Sandwich. Would love to see what you do with Promo 2. Would love to see what you do with Promo 3. Um, it really is, I think everybody has to embrace influencer marketing. It is, there's so much distrust when a brand speaks. Yeah. People know we're self-motivated. Yeah. But to have somebody that you admire or trust give you an opinion, it carries more weight than seeing me make a commercial that says, chicken is great. You know? Yeah. Who knows? Who am I? Yeah. Um, but if somebody that you know in your community gets on as like, this is a great value. Look how big these tenders are. It just has more influence. Yeah. Do you find it's interesting? You're working with celebrities like like Amber Wallen, all the way down to small influencers that where you're just giving a free box of chicken or a ticket for a for, for a box of chicken. What have you found has the best ROI? I mean, I mean, I know this is a tough question. I'm I'm sure you need all three, but when you think about your favorite types of influencers to work with, is there like a is there a type of influencer that you that you think has the best ROI? I, I, I take a Goldilocks approach, right? I think too small and you're not getting the level of expertise and quality too big and it becomes a little commercial. It's these folks in the middle who uh, really understand the art of influence and are choosy about who they take on that really are the most impactful. Uh, and so those are the ones that we're um, cultivating longer term relationships with. Awesome. What do they typically look like? Do you have certain metrics that you're looking at? Like in, in, your, in your head, is there like a North Star, like something between 100,000 to 200,000 uh, followers, something between five to 10% engagement? Like are there certain numbers that you metrics where you're like, that's my influencer? I like uh, I like a hundred thousand uh, followers or more. Engagement is more my thing. Um, Amber, for instance, had like a fifty percent engagement number, which is just crazy. Um, our stronger influencers had thirty between thirty and forty percent engagement, um, which I think is wonderful, um, especially when you look at ads that you place on meta or whatever that have two or 3% engagement to be able to get up into, you know, the tens, the twenties, the thirties is really 
strong. Yeah. Explain to the audience a little bit uh, more by, by engagement. Can you explain a little bit more about that? Like what does 50? Yeah. So we, like? yeah, we used to talk about, and people have probably heard about impressions, like how many people saw a piece of content, but think about how much content shows up in your phone and you're just like, duh, 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 get out, close, close, close. Engagement means that you interacted with it in some way. You liked it, you shared it, you commented on it, you forwarded it, whatever. Um, that shows a deeper level of involvement with the content. And so that's a much more important metric to us because if a hundred people scroll by my chicken, they're not, it's not an impact, no. but if, 20 of those 100, watch it all the way through, give it a love, send it to their mama. That shows me that we're making an impact. Crazy. Yeah. Um, and 50% is insane, especially when you consider Amber Wallen, like, uh, like I don't know, probably gets tens of thousands of, uh, of, of views or, or hundreds of thousands. And the fact that 50% of them engaged in some capacity, that's insane um do you find um we talking going back to what we were saying before like just being funny and being open um and just being like a fun brand is so important do you find that when you work with influencers you want to guide them towards being more fun or do you let them do their thing i let them do their thing i've tried in the past if i'm honest um to kind of script out what I want and what's perfect in my head. And boy, does that come off as fake. Hmm. Um, Cause if they're not being authentic to themselves, they're not having an authentic reaction to the brand and the product. And you can smell it from a mile away. Yeah. So yeah, um, we have this, we have this great influencer hungry for munchies um, who at the end of the last thing he did for us, takes a bite of the chicken and he goes, Oh, how blessed are we to live in a land where there's crispy, crunchy chicken? Like I never would have scripted that, but I love it so much. Like so I had it good. as a ringtone for a while. That's so good. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of like, like, I mean, I'll be very honest. Even like most of the times when I start a podcast, many times it's with people I've met two, three, four times maximum. And it's like in, in the beginning, I want to prepare everything. And so, you know, the opening always sounds a little bit robotic and, um, but then when I get into the flow and it's just me and it's just authenticity, like it always, it's always better that way. So I, I, yeah, I totally feel 100%. you. Yeah. Um, hot sauce question. How much, um, how much did you pay, um, big celebrities like Amber Wallen and, you know, people like that. All right. I'm going to take my hot sauce. Oh, I'm going to the medium one that has two chili peppers. It's called cyan. Cyan, you handle. Um, I'm very concerned that I will not handle it. It's higher than higher, it higher than five hundred thousand. No, not higher than. Oh, 500, okay, okay. We got some answer. All right, cheers. Cheers. Wow, chicken and biscuits. <laughs> Is that spicy? Oh my God. Yes. <laughs> Lord of mercy. Mm. Oh my God. Is that number three? No, that was the middle one. That was the middle one? Oh God. You're not going to like the last one. Uh, I'm terrified of the last all right, one. I'm going to mock three for the next one. I'm going to have it shaken up. Okay. Have it prepared. Oh, um, goodness. <clears throat> so you care about engagement. A lot more than impressions. I do. The influencers, many influencers charge on a per impression basis. Not with me. That's not how we do it. So how do you work? Let's say I'm an influencer and I want to, and I love your chicken and I'm like, I got to work with crispy, crunchy chicken. I reach out to you. How, what, what would the engagement look like? Yeah, we're pretty, um, because we're, we're not very well known yet. People, I think, understand, influencers understand that we're kind of a new player in the game. Hmm. So we pay, we negotiate a flat fee based on the number of uh, folks that they have based on their their geographic position. Uh, if they're in a high penetration area for me, I'll pay a little bit more. 
But the promise is always, let's see how it goes. If a lot of people engage with what you're doing, we're going to have a more. relationship yeah. for a long time. Yeah. So it's, uh, people have responded really well to that. Yeah. Yeah. I think just like find people that truly care about the brand and it goes both ways, right? Like you, you as yeah. you as a, as a leader of the brand, if you're going to think care for me, I got to care for you as well as an influencer. So it has, it goes both ways. It can't just be a one way street. So 100%. I love that you stick. One of our other core values is be a good egg. Um, we've got so many chicken puns, Explain. but it, it really is a big part from top down who we are as a company. So we treat people, it's the golden rule, right? Treat people the way you want to be treated. Um, or as I say, when we're negotiating deals, I want everybody to get a little cream in their coffee. I just don't want to buy you the cow yet. So <laughs> nice. I love that. You know, like we want you to be adequately compensated for the value that you're giving us because we want your full attention doing it. Yeah. We don't want to be a sucker, but if you can continually bring that value to the brand, that has value to us and we share that value with you. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. Um, <clears throat> all right. Moving down, moving down the, the, the chain a little bit. Um Want to do a little bit of a, a little bit of a change things up a little bit and ask you a few questions, just like rapid fire. Um, just going to ask you five questions and I want you to answer. Okay. I want you to answer with like a few words, one or one, one or two, uh, one or two words. Uh, okay. I'll start. I'll start. Um, what's, uh, give me one word to describe your leadership style. Collaborative. Uh, last book you read? I just, I just read Karen Slaughter's new book. Uh, I would love to have given you a better English major, uh, English major answer than that. But Karen Slaughter's a local Atlanta writer who does uh, kind of police procedurals with uh, a guy named Will Trent, and I just think she's a fabulous writer. Okay, one marketing trend you're skeptical about? AI. Ooh, biggest pet peeve in marketing? Intellectual laziness. Best piece of advice you've ever received? Uh, once the shoes are in the box, stop selling. Man, I really want to dive deeper into this. Uh, I'm going to write some notes. Pat, if you can, uh, if, or, or Sophie, if you can write a note on that. Uh, and then bonus, your favorite joke, if you can tell, give us your favorite, favorite pun or your favorite joke. Um, it's a chicken joke. Okay. It is my favorite joke. Let's do it. Um, uh, a chicken walks into a, a library and goes to the librarian and says, walk. And the library says, you want a book? Gives him a book. He walks out. Next day he comes back. Chicken says, walk, walk. Librarian gives him two books. <laughs> he walks out. Third day, chicken comes back. Walk, walk, walk. Librarian gives him three books, but is like so interested in what's happening. So he leaves the library, um, tails the chicken, sees the chicken go to a farm, to a pond, and lay the three books in front of a frog. And the frog looks at him and says, read it, read it, read it. That is, that's good. It's the worst joke. That's and good. I love it so much. That's good. Fuck. That's a good one. Um, I, I have I have a couple of jokes. I can, I, can I share a joke as well? I would love to hear a joke. So my tongue, my tongue was in the Guinness World Record book once. But, How so? but then the librarian took me to take it out, told me to take it out. <laughs> <laughs> Damn it, I screwed it up. Well done. I screwed the punchline up. Uh, yeah. I followed you. Yeah. Um, all right. Uh, so we're, we're nearing the end. We're nearing the end uh, of, the, of the episode. We have a few, few minutes left. Um, listeners that have made it this far clearly enjoy the conversation and probably want to learn more about you. So let's dive into your background a little bit. Uh, I know a lot of podcasts like to do it in the beginning, but um, I like to do it in the end because it's a good time, it's a good way for us to unwind and just kind of chat and and, ca and catch up on your life. What was your life like growing up? What was like, what was early life for Alice like, like growing up? Where did you grow up? How was, uh, you know, uh, were, your, were your parents kind of middle class, rich, poor? Like, what, what was life like for you? So um, I grew up in Savannah, Georgia, um, on um, 
the intercoastal waterway on Wilmington Island. And uh, my parents both worked. We were not rich. We we're not poor. We we're, you know, solidly middle class. Um, very strong work ethics. A lot of emphasis on achieving intellectually. Uh, a lot of push in that way. Um, but a really wonderful childhood. Mm. Did you know you were going to get into marketing? Or did you have other... No. Like, what, uh -uh. what, what were you interested in when you were young? So, uh, I went to Duke for my undergrad. Um, and I was a double major in uh, poetry and women's studies. Uh, and if you're keeping your face very neutral, which I love, because my parents were horrified. They routinely called the office of the president to say, can you teach her to do something so that she doesn't come home? Um, wow. And it's true. When I graduated, there was nobody who wanted to pay me a decent salary to write sestinas about the oppression of women. But I started working um, in a, a small office on, in a temp kind of capacity, and they didn't have a marketing team but they needed someone who could write position papers. Hmm. Uh, and when they found out that I could write, they offered me the opportunity to kind of be brought along by them. Was this, was this Snap, and... Snap Products? Yeah, this was Snap okay. Products. Snap Pro okay. Fix a flat, my first baby. Um, and so I, you know, I was there for a number of years, uh, learned the very entrepreneurial parts of marketing. Hmm. We were purchased by... Pennzoil, which became Pennzoil Quaker State, which became a division of Royal Dutch Shell. Wow. And I moved to Houston and started getting a much more formal marketing education uh, from one of my mentors, Steve, Steve Koch, wow. um, uh, who taught me every day from what is positioning to what is white space to how do we do research uh, and then got my MBA and transitioned into restaurants after about 10 years. Yeah, you did. You did almost ten years, like nine years and a nine years and a little bit between Snap Products and Pennzoil, and then you spent six years at Denny, Denny's. Um, I did. Yeah. So and then from then on, you just kind of fell in love with the the, the restaurant business and everything ever since. Kind of has been in the restaurant space, right? I love restaurants, right? So my first meeting at Denny's, um, I got asked because I was I came in through the Insights Group, and our first meeting was trying different kinds of bacon. And I remember calling my husband at break and saying, "Legit, my first meeting, all we did was eat bacon. Like this is definitely the place for me." Um, but it's such a dynamic environment restaurants so in packaged goods, you know, you plan out two years and it's like this and like this. In restaurants. You can make a decision today and have it in the space in two weeks if you want to. Mm. Um, and so I think restaurant people are a little bit crazy um, mm. and a little bit wonderful. Um, you either love it or it destroys you. And I happen to just love it. I love everything about it. Wow. And so like your 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 mentor that you met in your, your first couple of roles, Steve, Steve, did did he continue to be a mentor in your in your life or did you start because we all have different mentors for different stages of our life sometimes, but there are some mentors that just, that are just are there for a variety of different life cycles in your life. Cause they just care about you that much. Was, was Steve one of them or did you have, did you meet more mentors along the way? I have a number of mentors. Um, Steve was, has definitely been in and out of my life. Uh, he teaches at um, university of Houston. And sometimes I speak, to his MBA classes, mm. uh, great guy. Um, one of the first marketing leaders I worked for, Jason Abelkop, who runs uh, IPA agency now, um, I've known for 10 years and it used to be very mentor mentee, but now I think we're just friends, but still is a touchstone for me when I'm not sure how to think about something or I need a different perspective um, and, and value him so much and then this is going to sound cheesy but it is authentic mm. everybody i work for at this company from my boss jim norberg mm. um who is exceptionally intellectually gifted and mm. has a heart for the consumer that a lot of executives do not have to our uh, head of hr who really cares about culture one of the questions that we benchmark against is do you have a friend at work and i just think that's so telling mm. um and that fabulous to my brother, 
Joe Gordon, who's our chief execution officer. They call us the Wonder Twins. Oh, your brother um, works at... No, my kind of adopted brother. Oh, adopted brother, okay. Um, we're very close. We, we think of each other as brother and sister, but it's... Jim has put together a, a really strong, caring group of folks. Um, it's the best work environment I've ever had. That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, well, before we before we jump out, um, just one last hot sauce question, and uh, just curious. Um, you know, this is a, a big restaurant, and you got a big position. How how much are uh, how much are you making as, as a CMO? Um, not nearly what my value is, Simon. Oh, okay, we got we got to we got to talk to the team. We got we got to talk to the team. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna finish off strong. I'm going Mac three. All right, I am too. Go. I'm gonna do this. All right. Oh my gosh, I'm so nervous. I okay. am too. I'll I do it with you. just opened this. I oh my god, it's not even coming out. What the heck? Oh my god, is that thick? Holy smokes! <laughs> I'm scared, Alice. That's um, I am too. Well, all right, we're going to go down this road. Let's do it. Cheers. Cheers. Oh, my. Woo! No. Oh. I think my hair's on fire. <coughs> oh, wow. Oh, my goodness. Oh. Okay. Yeah, that's spicy. I need to get some milk. Yeah, that's spicy. Oh. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, Alice. Let's never do this again in person. I agree. Like not 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 hot sauce. Maybe like chicken dips. Come and try our our new honey mustard that we're working on. That'll be much better. Yeah. By the way, I didn't ask. I didn't get a chance to ask you how many locations are in Atlanta. In, in Atlanta. Oh my gosh, you're gonna catch me! I don't know, uh, several dozen. Yeah, because I was on. I was, yeah, we've got. I was on the map, and it looks like two, four, six, eight, ten, like twelve, four, fourteen locations. Maybe in Atlanta proper, but the DMA we have really heavy penetration. Atlanta sprawls, um, and just if you're anywhere in Atlanta, you're not too far from us. I see. Is there a big tech scene in Atlanta? Like tech? Um, tech oh, uh, yeah. There's, yeah, there's good tech here, of course. Uh, Atlanta is just a, a wonderful city. We have a lot of entertainment here. We have a lot of music here. We have a lot of creative here. We have a lot of education here. Yeah. Uh, it's, a, it, it's a quickly growing city. So we're happy to be here. Good place to run a happy hour for founders and executives. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Maybe we should talk. I've been running a lot of um, founder slash executive happy hours and dinners in Seattle, Vancouver, and Toronto. And I'm probably going to do one in San Francisco mm. and Atlanta. I've never thought about, but if you're saying there's a scene there, maybe we can bring some hot sauce, some chicken, and like 15, 20 executives uh, together. Here, I'll make you an offer. This is a beautiful office. We just built it. You can have it here. Ooh. And I'll cater it with all of our awesome products. We've had a few parties here. They're all fabulous. Ooh. We're right in Midtown, so everything is around. Midtown? Is that Open downtown? Is that like, no. Mm -mm. So, so we have Midtown. We have Buckhead. We have Downtown. We have the, the Burbs. The Burbs. Um, but a lot of the, the restaurant scene and a lot of the newer industry is here in Midtown. Okay. Let's schedule a call um separate okay. and then i'm gonna have to get some milk but uh before we jump out alice thank you so much for coming on on the call this was super duper fun how many shots did we do like four four shots four shots four shots um how can our listeners uh, uh find more about you and just kind of follow along your personal journey or or crispy crunchy chicken's journey like what? Yeah, so I'm on LinkedIn yeah. uh, at Alice Crowder, and anybody can get me. Um, we also, if they go to crispycrunchy.com, they can learn all about the brand. There's a great store locator there um, that would be happy to help them get to our newest location. Um, but yeah, either one of those. Awesome. Well, Alice, appreciate you, and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you so much. What a delight. <laughs>